And uh, joining us in, on the line is Anel Elwane, Black First and Land First Movement uh, Deputy President. And we have Adil Nchabiling, Transform RSA President. And uh, we have uh, Tsepo Khadima, Political Analyst, and uh, Jackie Shandu just joined us uh, as well. Good evening, gentlemen, and thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Uh, Zanella, just very quickly with the BLF saying that you're going to shut down operations in Stellenbosch. Uh, and, uh, you know, some might, might see this as an attack or unfair attack on Johan Rupert. How, how are you going to do this legally in, in the pursuit of trying to get a common ground around economic transformation? Um, good evening, Cindy, and good, good evening to the panelists. Well, the first thing we are going to do as the Black Cis Land Cis Movement, we are going to open a case of racism with the Equality Court against Johan Rupert. The second thing we are going to do we are also going to open a case of high treason against Johan Rupert because what he's trying to do is what is described as economic terrorism. We are not going to stop there. We are going to immobilize black people and our comrades in the Western Cape to shut down Ram Groff head offices of the Stellenbosch Mafia, which is Johan Rupert. We are also going to mobilize our people and expand on what radical economic transformation means because what Johan Rupert stands for in society is a death. Yeah, Zanella, just move around a little bit. We are, your, your, your phone line is not uh, very clear. I'll just ask them to repatch you and then we'll get back to you. Let's uh, engage uh, Berek Hadima. The, just in the comments in itself, it could be regarded as, you know, you have to consider what mood or what kind of an event it was that the audience was placid and wanting to hear that. How, how dangerous, in your view, or how seriously should we take these comments made by Johan Rupert? Look, it is appalling that we can have uh, Mr. Johan Rupert, who is chairman of uh, Compagnie de Richmond, uh, and Remgro, and a whole host of others that are operating, by the way, not just in South Africa, but for some strange reason that is weird, is that Mr. Rupert believes that uh, he can be participating in partisan politics of South Africa when he dares not do the same in any other jurisdiction where his company operates. And also it is uh, flabbergasting that uh, he has not invoked the relevant section in the memorandum of incorporation of any of his companies that empowers him to actually be engaged in partisan politics in the manner that it is doing. But the question that must be asked by South Africa is that why are we interested in Johan Rupert? This, by the way, is a man who is presiding over an empire that is responsible partly to the seven million people who die every year from tobacco smoking. He made his money, his father made his money from tobacco and alcohol. In this country, 39% of the carnage we have on our roads, alcohol is to blame for that. So it is astonishing that in fact he's held in high regard as he is, to the extent that even the Sunday Times so it fit to give him some award, I don't know if it's a lifetime award or top business uh, person of the year award, taking into account in terms of really if anybody that had to be held responsible for the harm and the lives that are lost, and he has made, he's a profiteer from the absolute uh, a, a destruction of lives and this is somebody that can even be given an award. I mean, what kind of a society are we? And here we have him now uh, really act actively engaged in partisan politics. He hasn't even answered the Guardian newspaper on the 12th of July came up with an exceedingly detailed article on partly on what British American tobacco is responsible for, where it is uh, bullying and uh, is using tactics that really uh, are nothing to really be proud about in countries such as Kenya, Uganda, and everywhere else where he is fighting anti-tobacco smoking. The same man who was smoking in the general uh, meeting of his shareholders, he had no respect for his shareholders at the company's general meeting, and he was smoking, and he said he can smoke anyhow. Why are we uh, tolerant of such, uh, such people who, at the end of the day, their ill-gotten gains, whose father moved? And we would appear, it would appear that it was really unlawfully. <coughs> Company de Richmond was moved to Luxembourg in 1959, just on the eve of the introduction of the foreign exchange controls. Mm.
Um, salam alaikum to you, Adilan. Thanks so much for for joining us. Radical economic transformation being referred to as merely a code name for theft. How do you dissect that particular statement? It's a very rich uh, statement coming from a man. Pun intended. Yeah, you know, actually rich because you know, in terms of the pun, <laughs> the pun intended part of it is. The aspect whereby you have a company which gives an AGM and on the AGM they report about the profits they've made over the period of a year. Currently, Richmond company is worth around 690 billion, which is half of South Africa's fiscal as well as treasury budget. So you don't expect anything less from somebody who holds half of South Africa's treasury budget to give you any less than a lip when they're going to be addressing you as part of one of the, this is just one of the companies that they are owning that has 690 billion. So we must understand the context by which this kind of statements are said. When it comes to his actually abrasive statements against the radical economic transformation and saying it is just a, another code word for theft, it means that he has very little confidence in black people in general, which means the so, South African society, particularly the black population that is on the periphery of everything in the economy, they are sitting on the marginal aspect of it. When it comes to aspect of ownership, we don't own any Anything. When it comes to control, we're not controlling anything. When it comes to management in our economy, we're not managing anything. When it comes to skills, we don't have adequate skills and everything. When it comes to industry and as well as industry participation, control, as well as ownership, black people do not own anything. So for Rupert to be giving us a leap about people who are going to be stealing when we're saying we're implementing radical economic transformation, it tells you a story that his mind is so little it only considers radical economic transformation on an aspect of government budget basis. Here we're not talking government when we say radical economic transformation. We're talking industry, particularly private industry, where there must be a change and a direct shift in terms of how things have been done in the past. Yeah. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange must be open so that we can access capital as black entities as well as black operators to start doing things independently rather than being told by white people that when we say radical economic transformation, we mean a code word for, th for thievery as as well as stealing. Yeah, but Jackie, how do we move beyond uh, the radical economic transformation being misconstrued or, or being interpreted as having the intent to reverse apartheid, i.e. take away from the white and benefit black people, to as a society to have open and honest conversations that inequality is glaring, we have a poverty levels that are the highest in the world, etc. Look, uh, <laughs> I'm tempted to go back to Steve Bigo because, I mean, it's, it's Steve Bigo month. One of the mistakes we made historically was to think that apartheid was a mistake or colonialism was a mistake. We need to understand that the oppression of black people by whites in South Africa throughout the world has always been a conscious, deliberate act meant at accumulating wealth for the white minority at the expense. So what I'm saying is to, it seems to me, sometimes we want to moralize this discourse. We want to make some appeals to white conscience, feel for us we are poor. They know this. In fact, they have been historically right at the program of deliberate impoverishment of the black majority because that's where you get whites to accumulate wealth. So for us to move to the next level as black people in South Africa, we need to come to that realization that no amount of moral lectures of trying to appeal, of trying to speak sense. We must understand this phenomenon called power and how it works and how we can use it to advance the interests of black people. Hence, a lot of people have been speaking about black power, black consciousness to say, let us use our clout as the native majority there is no justification intellectually, morally whatsoever that a clique of colonial settlers who meted out so much violence on us continue to benefit. That explains the arrogance of this settler, this land thief called Rupert, because they've been at this for so long and black people still seem not to get it because they want this approval, they want this contract, social uh, consensus contract with whites. It's not going to happen. Zimbabwe is a recent case study that no amount of reasoning will get whites to surrender the land or everything they've stolen. But is it's it that only yeah. when you take and you don't ask, because it's yours, it belongs to you. 
That's the only time you're going to make a difference. Okay, I think maybe the difference with in South Africa being a multicultural uh, democratic constitution, mm -hmm. we might be safe and not turn out like a Zimbabwe. I'm not sure if that's necessarily where radicalism is, is going. But I hear you that if we are not decolonized as a, a black majority and driving that agenda that squarely just wants to deal with issues of inequality and inclusion of the economy, as opposed to this... A biki biki makimir mm. kind of approach that we've had in the past 23 yeah. years. We had a constitution during colonialism. We had a constitution Correct. during apartheid. The constitution is uh, made for the people. The people are not meant or purposed Correct. for the constitution. Mm. So if we don't start to think hard on that, and those who, uh, for whatever reason, they believe that this constitution is going to continue to protect them despite the uh, cries and the interest of ordinary people, they have something coming their way. There is restitution and South Africa requires restitution and economically in order for us to have a normal society where everybody else can be safe. Not long from now, as we have an increasing army of people who continue to sing Chico Tola's song, that they are, they are poor and they need some money, and at the same time that poverty is increasing, mm. those are going to rise up. And people like Johan Rupert, they better, they better take note because they will not be able to continue in this uh, manner that they're doing where effectively they want to be politicians. Maybe if he had, uh, uh, he took a leaf from uh, a book from ancient times, there was a rich young ruler who met with a rabbi. And after having met with that rabbi, he asked certain questions. And one of the things before uh, he left there, the rabbi named Jesus Christ said to him, sell everything and give it to the poor. And he left sorrowful. Let's hope that Mr. Rupert will sell everything and give it to the poor for restitution in order for him to have peace of mind. Because in this way that he's going, this really, his, his, his comments, they cannot be justified under any circumstance whatsoever. And unfortunately, his growing arrogance, we know as a matter of cause, by the way, that he had a direct uh, intervention in the appointment of Praveen Godan in 2015, or, yeah. Yeah, to be the Minister of Finance, or 2014, uh, that time. We know that he had direct say in that uh, Praveen Godan must be the Minister of Finance. So we must be asking harder questions now. And we must hold people like Johan Rupert, the very rich, to the same moral high ground that they are demanding on other people. I, it's still beyond me why Sunday Times gave him, taking into account the background that I have I've sketched out, was it poor judgment or was it that the Sunday Times, they too share his views, which certainly are not advancing yeah. this democracy but, but, in any yeah, shape or form. Yeah, but his views could also be uh, extended in society generally, where in dinner conversations, one would argue that, you know, it was uh, blood, sweat and gore that uh, white people uh, accumulated wealth and escalated to this level of prosperity. And somehow we, we, we have this... Um, I would like to see yeah, the tobacco farmers in Limpopo. Yeah, you know, who amnesia. Went on the we have selective that amnesia that life only started and, uh, in, in this country in 1994. Yeah, they are, they, are, they are in hospital now and they are having a bad quality of life. They've got all manner of illnesses and they were working on his tobacco farms. Yeah, I just want to deal with that sort of social psyche that, is, you know, you black people somehow were twiddling our thumbs under the shade while white people were amassing uh, wealth. Remember the psyche of white people who are wealthy and obscenely rich is that black people are workers, are servants, are domesticated. They only come to serve, and that is the only purpose why they are created and they are on earth. So that kind of a psyche, you shouldn't be surprised about it because they are born and bred to always think that money, wealth, and power is the only barometer by which you determine a human being. You can never expect, and again, we mustn't be fooled. Remember that the voice of a rich man echoes far deeper and far farer than a voice of a poor man because nobody listens to you when you have very meager means. And in this case, particularly the ANC government, which is the poorer government that is leading a majority of poor people, will never be given the day of the day, will never be given actually an advantage in the day because they have nothing that they can prove for. The only thing that they can control is the state coffers as well as the state machinery. In the absence of that, who holds the power? 
I repeated it that 12 trillion of South Africa's income as well as capital and assets sit on the South African Johannesburg Stock Exchange. In the JSE, 12 trillion they sit and trade it amongst themselves every year given in and out where they buy assets they sell assets to each other they swap shares they do all sorts of bonds and then given the fact that government only controls 1.56 trillion okay give the two I, did, I, did, I beg your pardon i believe uh, zanella luana is back with us blf uh, Deputy President, uh, Zanella, thanks again for joining us. I don't want this to turn into a bickering session. You said you're taking decisive action to finally deal with uh, the issue of uh, uh, economic exclusion. Now, the high treason, uh, or rather economic terrorism that you're talking about, the deliberate destabilization of the economy and rendering the majority poor as mere workers, what is the intention going forward? I mean, how soon are you lodging this particular complaint? Um, we would like to put it on record that Johan Rupert is a land thief and is a white racist and is a foreigner in this country. And before this month even ends, we are going to mobilize people in the Western Cape province to shut down his source of revenue, which is them over many other countries. Now, Zanella, we're not having any joy, my dear. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to let you go. Zanella Luane, BLF uh, Deputy President. Is there merit? I mean, obviously we have to work within the confines of the law if there's a, a high treason or an economic terrorism case being uh, put before the Equality Court. What would the court have to determine? I think uh, the people will, as they get informed, they will no longer tolerate uh, conduct of uh, very rich people like uh, Johan Rupert. They will start asking hard questions. And I think one of the effective remedies, by the way, for people like uh, Johan Rupert and particularly on restitution, is for the president to appoint the Judicial Commission of Inquiry that would look into what generally has got to be called state capture, but pre-1994. If the president can do that, it will be the best thing that he has done for the next millennia. For this country that once and for all, we can get to hold people accountable and ask them the right questions as to say, yes, they are wealthy. How did they become rich? And as I make an assertion, the circumstances that led to company de Richmond to be a Luxembourg company, instead of being in Stellenbosch and instead of being in South Africa or wherever it might have been in South Africa. Those circumstances must be investigated. And of course, uh, also over the years, the investments that they made, over the years, the, tracks, the large tracts of land that uh, Johann Rupert's father and he now has is the successor in title uh, of what is called the Transfrontier Parks, bordering South Africa in Botswana, Zimbabwe, as well as uh, in Mozambique, where large tracts of, uh, of land belong to one man. Maybe that's where we need to first start by expropriation without compensation. It is not feasible that somebody could have bought a land big enough, which is bigger than even certain countries. Expropriation without compensation, I think, would be an effective measure to deal with, with uh, his uh, ill-gotten uh, gains of large tracts of land, even in the Karoo. We know that, by the way, his uh, uh, threatened court action was uh, that against uh, any exploration of shale gas in the Karoo because uh, he wants to protect that which he believes is his. And I don't know what gave him uh, that mind. I mean, John Jacques Rousseau, I think the philosopher, said it right, that if we are gullible enough when somebody, you know, packs a piece of land and says, this is mine, then that means maybe your hundred pet is the inventor of civilization in South Africa. I yeah, think, but I'm just saying, going yeah. back to, to, to the legalities around transformation, and we know there's a pushback and resistance. Mm -hmm. the, the, the likes of you, Andrew, put, have entrenched themselves and have a sense of entitlement, uh, notwithstanding that the, that the wealth sh should be shared amongst the people who live in it, as a, it, it is in the Bill of Rights. But we're not seeing that. So how do we move this, this conversation to, to, to take shape, to be tangible, to have practical mechanisms to, to, to the goal that we want to be. You see, as the public, particularly the black, black public and population, we have the power. We are 80% consumers in this country. 80% of the goods that are sold and bought in South Africa that Johan Rupert owns companies in, from Unilever, from the Remgros, from the Rainbow Chickens, from every industrial Salati sector sugar. that they are involved in, the Salati Sugar, in the game parks that they have, in the tourism and lifestyle, we must boycott 
this type of personalities and companies that are insulting us and are insulting the black intelligence and ability. So the first action right now is to go on a massive rampant boycott action. And we must make sure that we sanction these individuals so that they never ever again use their ill-gotten apartheid gains and money to ever come back and insult us. We are building a country right now. And from a transformers point of view, we are intolerant toward white monopoly capitalist racist who use money as an influence. So we are saying boycotting their companies is the first start. We can educate the public as to who owns what in this country. Yeah. From the soap that we wash within our bathrooms is owned by Rupert, by the way, to the salt that you consume, to the sugar that you have in your tea, to the aspect of the companies and the cars that government is borrowing on a daily to day basis, to the industry sector so we must know what it is that they have in control of and boycott them that's the first action to actually yeah. and make Jackie, them should we be so precious about social cohesion and not causing racial division etc when we talk about economic transformation very briefly well, I firstly want to uh, differ with uh, the suggestion that it is only the white rich that are arrogant recent history in this country shows you We've been called baboons. We've had your Garrett Cliffs, your Steve Hoffmeyers. I could go on and on, practically urinating on our heads, calling us all sorts of things in our country that they stole. And for as long as we don't use our means, the means we have at our disposal, to get back what was wrongfully taken away from us, there is no way that we are going to succeed in getting justice and in, in getting whites to recognize our humanity because this speak to this continuing refusal to acknowledge the humanity of black people and that's why people like Rupert and all whites for that matter think that it is okay for black people to continue to live in squatter camps now you also have this confusion on the political class where the ANC in Etewin for that matter would put aside tens of millions for some social cohesion uh, uh, programs, whereas we should be prioritizing social justice mechanisms, we're exploring ways of redirecting resources from the white rich to the black majority, especially resources that come from the state. It is heinous crime that you still have the vast majority of the budget of provincial governments, of municipalities, being given to white businesses when that should be the first and the easy, simplest place from which to effect economic transformation before we even get to the private sector. That which we have mm. at the our policy, disposal the as the black majority. are there. It's the implementation. Mm. I Group hear you, economics. Jackie. We, we're economics. going to have to leave it there, Jackie Shandu, political commentator. Salam alaikum. Adil Shabba Transform RSA president. Sepo Khadima, a, a political analyst. And unfortunately, we weren't able to get through to Zanele Luane properly because her line uh, was acting up. But we're going to have to leave it there at the moment. Thanks for watching ANN7 Prime. We're back after this.